Okay, then we are ready to, to start again. Um, and I've told Flo and Scala here that you know there's absolutely no pressure at all uh, in this. And you know I've told them I'm really looking forward to this talk, and they are going to talk about uh, passphrase wordless generation. And I'm very happy to tell them once again that the author of Diceware is in the audience. And so you know, uh, please welcome uh, Flo and Scala from uh, Perio. So, um, welcome to Passphrases for Humans. Uh, so, um, I'm, my name is Flo, uh, Florencia Haravega. I'm the CTO at Perio, um, and we are a tiny startup that you may or may not have heard of. So, my own background is I'm a developer, I'm not a security researcher, so I'm, I'm tackling this uh, problem of passphrases from a sort of developer perspective and a developer who's very interested in uh, user advocacy and user education. My name's Skylar Nagao, I'm product manager at Perio, but kind of a humanities geek and that'll hopefully shine through a little bit in some of the work we're doing here. Huh. It's, um, it's just a switch. Where? Yeah, oh, there got we go. That work now? Oh yeah, it does. Whoa. Um, so to give you a little brief overview, we're gonna, the beginning will be some basics. We're gonna introduce Perio, passphrases, and some of the standards that we arrived at. Uh, move towards the problem with some maybe the existing Diceware dictionaries, discuss then what we th consider a more cultural approach to how we can j develop these word lists, and then uh, move to the future and some ideas that we're already working on, some ideas that are out there, review some current research, and then we'd also love to hear from the audience if there's time about their experiences or ideas here. Um, for anyone who's not familiar, we just wanted to have a couple of definitions just so we're all on the same page. We're going to use some pretty broad ones here. Passphrase is really just like a password, but it's just usually longer and composed of words. There are different ways you can do this, but we gave two examples on the, bo on the board in some basic ways. And entropy is just a lack of predictability. To have more entropy is to have less predictability. So if you were to guess one number on these dice, the 20-sided dice would be harder to guess correctly. So for some background um, what, of what the app is for context, um, so we do uh, easy to use uh, message and file, sh file sharing with an emphasis on Teams. Um, so it's, it's cloud-based um, and everything is end-to-end -end encrypted and users need to be able to log in from any device on any platform uh, with a passphrase. So we derive the user's private key from the passphrase using uh, Blake 2S and Script. And um, basically, so what that means is we don't ever get the private keys. So if the user loses the passphrase, they're screwed. So the passphrases are a very important component of actually being able to use the software at all. Um, so when we say that we want this to be easy to use, uh, we want users to have to, to be allowed to not think very much. Um, so that should also mean that the, the software should be very hard to screw up. So, for example, that's one of the reasons we're doing end-to-end -end encryption by default, so that you can't accidentally reply to something and send it in plain text. Um, there's actually no way to send stuff unencrypted. So, there's some stuff, though, where there is user input required, such as choosing a passphrase, and so that's where things get really dicey in terms of enforcing some sort of sane default. Um, so, minimum password strength is a, is a big question mark for us. Um, so, so, for the sake of, of our research and our, our development style, there's a couple of assumptions that we're making and we get that these are controversial in some ways, but, but this is just kind of what, what we're rolling with. So the first thing is that people cannot and will not remember more than a few passwords. So for example, I know that I have several hundred passwords, there's no way I can memorize several hundred passwords. Um, we also think that password managers are great for most people in most use cases, precisely because you, you have a million services and you have to be able to, to access them and have good passwords for them. And we also think that critical services should have strong passwords. So that includes, so that say, let's say that maybe you have a password manager, like one password, and you have a great passphrase for that. And maybe you also have a great passphrase that you memorize for your like Gmail and your Facebook, which you might need to access from someone else's computer from time to time if your phone is dead or whatever. So, um, so based on these assumptions, uh, when we're deciding on defaults, um, we have a bit of a trade-off to make. So there's, there's things that are, 
there's, there's some s stuff that's more secure, but maybe it's less convenient, and we need to constantly straddle the line. And so that's basically what we do every single day, is say, okay, well, this thing is the more secure thing, but it's also less convenient, and then we, we have to kind of extrapolate from there and sort of imagine what kind of scenarios um, most users will be encountering and pick some sort of sane default from there, and then also figure out what kind of configurations we want to allow uh, users to define on their own. So in terms of, of modeling threats, um, it's, it's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of an exercise in, in fantasy, but it's also fun. So um, at what point does trying to crack a password become unreasonable for an attacker? So that, that depends on who the attacker is and what, how much time and money they have. So does your, does your attacker have $5, $1,000, maybe $1 million? <laughs> Um, it turns out that in certain situations, you do get someone who has a million dollars to crack something, so like the FBI, for example. Um, and if you look at you know, like the biggest budgets that you can possibly find, um, that's kind of what you're looking at. Um, and then there's this wonderful paper uh, from Joseph Bonneau and uh, Stuart Schechter uh, that kind of takes a look at uh, gigantic hashing operations um, and, and how much they cost, and sort of extrapolates from there that something like performing a two to the power of 80 hashes in a year would cost around one billion for a centralized actor, sort of based on uh, what you see in Bitcoin, which isn't a centralized actor, but is in fact distributed and you know, it not optimized in various ways. So that's, that's like really, really high end. Um, and so we decided we'll, we'll take a high end standard, and so we call it the billion dollar standard. Um, so a billion and a full year is probably more money and time than like anyone is willing to spend on cracking a password. So if we go up beyond that standard, we start getting, we start having really, really high entropy requirements, which is going to mean like really crazy, crazy passwords or passphrases, um, which really affects usability. And also like realistically, you know, we all know that um, you know, if someone's out to get you, that the cracking a password is not where they're going to spend all their time and money because there's going to be way easier things that they can do, um, even if you do have billions of dollars at your disposal. So, um, so therefore, we arrive at this, at this entropy requirement, which is um, based on, on the way that we generate our keys. We, we're using public key stretching, uh, private key stretching, sorry, with, um, with S-Script. And so we actually end up uh, needing, in order to get 81-bit passwords, which are our $1 billion passwords, we actually need a passphrase with 67.5 bits of entropy. And then we stretch that uh, with S-Script, um, with the, 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 basically the most amount of S-Script that we can manage that on a slow phone's processor, it doesn't take like ages to actually sign into your account. Um, so, yeah. Um, so from there, um, I'll let Skylar take over. So, uh, it may not mean much to uh, everyone, I guess, but uh, to start, so we're, our goal is to hit 67.5 bits from our users. And the problem, right, is that most people are really terrible at making passwords. Like, I, I don't need to iterate too much on this. Two little stats. Uh, one study found 30% of users were using one of the most 10,000 common passwords. Ashley Madison, um, you know, you would think would be a very maybe more privacy-minded service. Yeah, it turned out hundreds of thousands of people were using passwords like those that you see on the board, like one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, a data dump from Gmail in 2014 revealed that the average password strength was roughly like 21.6 bits. You know, so this is quite far off um, from our requirements. And unfortunately, it's not just like some, you know, Joe Schmo, whatever, who's writing the, uh, creating these passwords. Like, in that same dump were passwords from you know, the companies you see on the board. We have journalists from major news networks, a division chief at the Department of State, a PayPal senior engineer. And, you know, it's like, oh, no surprise that, like, the GitHub developer has a 96-bit password. But all these other people who, you know, uh, all of us are probably trusting with our data, you know, may not be doing as well here. So, you know, we have this question, like, well, how do we ensure our users are meeting this standard? And, I mean, one thing would be to use things like password meters. This is one of my favorites, the passive-aggressive password meter, where as you're entering characters, it'll tell you just how bad your password actually is. Um, before, before we continue, we, so we were given some little treats slash booze before starting and told that we can give them out for um, however we please, really. So uh, since we're going to be discussing this, does anyone know how to pronounce this? And I refuse to accept anyone who just tells me each individual letter. So whoever pronounces this for us gets this. I'll pronounce it Dropbox. Yeah. 
Uh, we can we can we can run with that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. sure. <laughs> I've I, that's I've been calling it Zixbin th this whole time. Um, we can call it the Dropbox method though. <laughs> So, you know, one problem with these like entropy estimates is like, the, well, the traditional method is like, well, okay, how many different characters are there? And then multiply that by how many characters are in the password. And then you might see numbers like this. And it's like, oh, cool, like I can have like leap password and I'm like almost at this requirement, right? Well, you know, this Dropbox method is like, actually, no, nah, that doesn't really fly because, you know, um, it accounts for some human elements, like people's tendency to use these common keyboard patterns or people's tendency to just try to work around password rules in the laziest ways possible, like apparently one out of four people will basically just add one to the end of their password. Yes. Some people are either really creative, really lazy, or really egoistic and just use their name for both username and password. I don't know if you all can see this because it's kind of small, but here's like a breakdown of what's Zixbin Dropbox method looks like, where you know we for fun we entered a password that would pass most standards. It is baseball one two three written in leet, so with mixed case numbers and such. And you can see that it actually detects like oh you know what you use the word baseball, which happens to for some reason in America be the ninth most common word appearing in passwords. It recognized the the letter substitutions and these common sequences. So although this would pass many standards, it turns out to be something that would be cracked uh, instantly. So our first solution was kind of like a classic lazy developer solution, which was like, oh, okay, so there's this tool that we can just import, and we'll just, we, we realize that maybe this is not quite good enough, like the, the estimates that it's giving are maybe a little off. Um, so okay, let's just require 100-bit passphrases, and then we'll like write all this intro text about how to choose a good passphrase, and we'll give a strength meter, and that's totally a great solution, and users will totally do the right thing, and it'll be great. And then, of course, it wasn't. Um, so basically, the feedback that we started getting was like people hated it. And like, it, it, we just got so many support requests of people complaining that like, they were entering 50 character long passwords. And they were basically writing whole novels into the password, passphrase field. And, um, and they were still not hitting the entropy requirements. And, it was, and, and we were seeing also a lot of lost passphrases. And people emailing support being like, I'm locked out of my account. And us being like, you know, we can't help you. Sorry. Um, so that was pretty bad. And I mean, what we found is that people are basically mad at, bad at making passphrases for many of the same reasons as passwords. Um, I mean, well, on one side, they're just not used to it. And so these rules like were confusing and had some overhead. But the other thing is that they're still predictable. Like when we get a request that verbatim said, well, I've entered 50 characters and I'm not passing this. And we're like, well, I mean, we have this tool, and it's like, yeah, if you enter password, 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 you know, it might be 50 characters, but it's not going to fly. Um, the other problem we had is that you know, some people succeeded, and then we were talking to our users to get some feedback. And one of the things that constantly came up was like, oh, yeah, I just used like, this, like, this quote from like, my favorite book or my favorite band, which also happens to be listed as one of my likes on Facebook or Tumblr or whatever other platform that's really easy for people to find. Um, and in these cases, you can see that these Drake and Bon Jovi quotes actually passed this 100-bit uh, standard. Uh, another problem is that language is pretty predictable. Like, you know, we like to think we are able to create random statements or sentences, but as, it ha you know, as is the case, language follows patterns, and machines are really good at identifying this. This is uh, some data from Google's Ngram charts, and basically what it's saying is that if you enter the word you, what words are most likely to follow? Because it's not going to be every word in the English dictionary. It's going to be you can, you are. And that can actually go to multiple levels, like you cannot, you can get, you can see. And you can see how this really quickly narrows down the you know, possible uh, uh, options that a machine needs to run through. Another issue is that when you let users pick their own, um, their own passwords, their memory is fallible. Like, uh, I would say close to half, if not more, of our forgotten passphrase support tickets were resolved by, did you capitalize the first letter? Did you add a period at the end? And that resolved many, 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 many. The other fun part with this user, uh, you know, user chosen uh, system with meters was how meters themselves work. And in this case, it's like, cool, you did it. Like, OK, cool, this is my super sweet password. I'm going to put in this last letter. Uh, and uh, too bad, like password doesn't isn't appreciated by Zixbin or Dropbox. So it's just like really frustrating experience to be typing and being like, yeah, and then never mind. 
So, you know, we're still sort of at the same question of like how, how can we actually ensure that um, you know, users meet this standard. And in this case, passive aggressive password meter had some great advice. You know, maybe if you just mash your head onto the keyboard, it would be more secure, which could also mean maybe if you just had a way to randomly generate content, then, you know, users wouldn't have to think about the passwords they create, and we could get reliable standards for estimating password entropy. And the best part of all of this is, is that academics have actually studied this already and found that it doesn't matter if users pick their own passwords or they're given to them. They are just as likely to remember or forget them either way. So it's like, well, okay, if it doesn't make a difference, why, why not let it be random? Oh. Um, so then we get into, I guess, some of the problems with passphrases. Um, I assume most people in this talk are familiar with this comic. And this comic is, you know, five years old now. And this is what basically got me interested in passphrases in the first place. I didn't know what they were like a year and a half ago. Um, and I saw this and I was like, oh wow, this is awesome. This is a really easy solution to avoid things like this that I get asked all the time. Um, this is a particularly bad list. And this is a real list of password requirements. If you can't see, it says you need exactly eight characters. You need at least one letter, one number, and one special character. But those special characters can only be at hashtag or dollar sign. Um, it can't be in the first or last. It has to be like a different one than you use over the past five times. It's huge and terrible. It requires a simile, a metaphor, and the name of one of your children. <laughs> um, and I mean, it could be, no, it, it doesn't. <laughs> um, and I mean, it could be that passphrases are also a fair bit longer, right? Like on the left is a randomly generated password, and on the right is a passphrase, and you can see the passphrase has almost twice as many characters. On the other hand, the passphrase only has five chunks of data that you need to remember. With the 13 character password, I have to remember 13 characters. With the passphrase, I remember five words. Another issue is that uh, passphrases need to be localized. You can't just give an English passphrase to a French speaker and expect them to remember these five English words. And um, that means you also need different dictionaries for every single language. And it also means each language presents its own problems. Like, for example, German is, not, is probably going to have longer passphrases than French or English. Um, also, against passphrases, there's some evidence that passphrases aren't more usable than passwords. One study found that five-character passwords were significantly easier to remember and faster to type than equivalent strength three to four-word passphrases after, um, after using them for a few days. However, the same study found that six-character passwords were significantly harder, more annoying, and less fun to learn than the five-character passwords that, you know, good for us, using larger dictionaries for passphrases didn't seem to affect memorability at all. And that, importantly, and a word you rarely hear with, pa with passwords and passphrases is that people found passphrases more fun to learn. On the other hand, when we started looking at what happens when you use stronger requirements for passwo passwords and passphrases, turns out that a six-word passphrase is significantly more likely to be memorized faster and more reliably than a 12-character password when using a service over a couple weeks. So, okay. So what makes, what, what are the, could it be that the problem with passphrases is actually just the words? So our question was, what actually makes a good passphrase dictionary? And, and that's something that we hadn't seen a lot of research on. So, so what we looked at was, you know, the most famous word list is the diceware list. And so the idea there was uh, almost 8,000 words, uh, short words. Um, and they're supposed to be common, but arguably words like Zlati, Wuhan, and NCAA, and Boise, as in Boise, Idaho? Yeah. Um, are not actually particularly common and also are very culturally specific. And also there's a bunch of, of you know, like kind of gibberish that is included in there. So, and, and one of the things that, that for us was just not, didn't quite go with our philosophy was the uh, suggestion that, uh, you know, if you don't know a word, you should look it up. And for us, you know, we want to reduce friction as much as possible for the user. So we don't want people to like, you know, need to go to some external site to look something up in order to be able to find it memorable. So, so that's something that didn't work for us. So a, a different example is uh, SecureDrop, which uses a sort of trimmed down version of the diceware list, uh, and it removed um, a bunch of stuff from it, like Americanisms and symbols and uh, gibberish, but it still has some pretty difficult words. Um, there's also the PGP word list, which is very short, um, and um, it also has very long and kind of hard to spell words. It's actually meant for uh, being spoken, so th that, that factors in there. 
Um, there's also, um, so, so Perio was originally based on, on Minilock, and Minilock came with a list of words, which was extremely long. And um, it, uh, we don't actually know where the source, what the source from that is, uh, but it includes some pretty long and obscure words. Um, for example, does anyone, can it, we, we have some more booze for anyone who can spell the word psoriasis? Without looking at your phone right now. <laughs> yeah. I think, yes. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. We, 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 okay, what is an epicycloid? Excellent. Oh. Congratulations, we are all a bit... We have an educated audience. Yes, we are all a bit smarter today. <laughs> <laughs> so we also have up to the, up to the minute? Up to the minute, which is... Up to the minute. So this is fun. Um, we also have... There's also this uh, uh, study, uh, Correct Horse Battery Staple, which uses another uh, word list, which is from the uh, contem Corpus of Contemporary American English. Um, and that's a much shorter word, but it has a much shorter list. But it does use really long words, and it, it, it did actually find that character length was a, uh, character length in a general passphrase or password was actually a huge factor in usability. So the study found that five character passwords were more memorable than three to four um, uh, four word passphrases. But length seems to have featured in that. So that's so that's something that we took note of. There's also this other study that we love. Um, towards reliable storage of 56-bit secrets in human memory, um, which uses a much shorter list as well. Um, and it actually does do a lot of trimming. Um, so it's chosen from uh, Google's Ngram corpus, and it, it eliminates words that are close to each other, um, so, hard to con so easy to confuse, and um, also removes prefixes so, uh, so that autocomplete can work better, um, and excludes vulgar words, plural words, and slang. So it's got a little bit of the sort of cultural element of trying to figure out what are good words for a human. Um, so that's, that's pretty great, um, but one of the things that we had a lot of questions about is what words are people actually likely to know? And if they know them, then we might extrapolate from there that, it, that those are the words that people are likely to remember. And another question that we ask is what words are easy to type? Um, the other question for us, given our entropy requirements, is how many words do we want to use? So these lists have a huge range, I mean from 200 and something to 56,000. So, um, and, and a larger list means, of course, that we get more entropy per word, but it also means um, more characters per word on average, and it also means that we get weirder words like epicycloid and whatnot. Um, so we think that the problem in, in, all of these, in all of these lists is that this is actually a UX problem, and so a lot of these lists have been designed by developers and the security professionals, and they haven't been formulated from a sort of more um, usability kind of side. Um, and so we, that, that's a problem that we found really interesting. Um, and that is how we got to uh, a cultural approach to passphrases. Which we're also dubbing how Seinfeld and Game of Thrones makes passphrases better. So like a quick review, some of the technical approaches is like, well, use shorter words, use words based on patterns, use phonetically distinct words or semantically distinct words, make it friendly for autocomplete and autocorrect. But some of the questions we were interested in is like, well, what words do people know? What words do they know how to spell? What languages do people speak? What edu uh, education level can we expect from people? What words might offend people? And like one simple thing is like, well, what do users actually think of this? Like, are these words working for them or not? You know, talk talk to your end user. So you know, on the first question, it's like, well, what words do we pick? And we could pick the most common words that appear in corpuses, like from Coca, Google Ngrams, Wiktionary, and these are cool because they help us identify the most frequently used words in in English. But we're wondering if like, we should include all these words. You know, like, these, these lists include, for example, the Harvard Law Review, which has a flight grade reading level index saying that you should have been in school for about, I think, 33 years to understand most of the content in there. In contrast, Dr. Seuss has a, gr a grade index of one, i.e., you can have almost no education and be able to read uh, uh, some, some Dr. Seuss books. So basically what we think is that, well, what if we sourced the most commonly used words from the most accessible sources, 
right? because we know language has some social biases of like who gets published and where and in which mediums. And the mediums themselves have different words. Like the most common words appearing in printed media is not the same as what appears online, is not the same as television and film. And so, you know, when trying to source words to protect the kingdom, uh, you know, we, are, we used popular film and television. Um, for most languages, corpuses from opensubtitles.org. And we did this on one side because, you know, popular video is accessible and well known, tends to get translated on its own anyway. Or also, you know, if, if you're looking at other languages, there's also local media that gets closed captioned and all of that also ends up on opensubtitles.org. Yeah, opensubtitles.org actually as a source is fantastic because in many cases it's also local translators too. And so people from, the, from that language will actually be the ones, um, you know, recreating their phrases in a more culturally relevant way. But importantly, subtitles were actually studied and found to have a, uh, you know, that the word frequency data from subtitles is more accurate. This is a more accurate indicator of reading performance in a culture and word recognition that when uh, studying French, American, English speaking, Dutch, Chinese, and Greek youth, they actually found that the way kids were learning was most accurately um, measured by the words they knew in subtitles, not by corpuses from written texts. So if we you know, take that as our, our source, we still have the question of like, well, how many words? You know, like, do we keep it small? Do we keep it huge? Um, do we take you know, the common wisdom? Or you know, do we just ask the question, well, how, how many words is someone actually likely to know? Um, for this, we used uh, a, a website called testyourvocab.com. It's basically been a long-term research project that I think has been on for like 10 years where they just ask people to take this quiz online and it'll measure their vocab. And we wanted to try and take one of the lower percentiles because we wanted to be as accessible as possible, which for an 18 year old, so you know, high school graduate um, possibly, in the lower 20th percentile, it was measured that they would know about 15,800 words. So, using, so we just you know, started with this as our guide. So our process was basically find a large corpus of subtitles for the language you're working on, compare that against the native language dictionary to try and get rid of slang, sound cues, or potential typos from the subtitles, organize the remaining list by word frequency, isolate the 20 to 35,000 most common words, um, depending on the language and how large the corpus was, remove offensive words from the list, and then start trimming it down by removing the longest words until the list is about 12,000 words long. And the result is that we have 12,000 uh, word lists of the shortest and most common words in a language with a cultural basis for assuming that people actually know what these words are. It also means we end up with a larger dictionary with more entropy per word. You can see that compared to, one of, say, a word list with only 1,000 words, you would need five words instead of seven words in your passphrase for a similar strength. It also tends to mean that when you have less words, and they might be a little longer, that it may not actually result in that much longer of a passphrase than just having more shorter words, which has been some of the conventional wisdom for now. So uh, we threw this up here. This is um, from a, one of the newest EFF short word lists coming up um, that has an average of 4.5 characters per word and requires about six words to have similar strength to a five word um, period passphrase. And they're, on average, they're very similar in length. Just so you guys can get an idea of what this looks like, we, we thought it'd be fun to generate the first uh, like, uh, few diceware and period passphrases to see what they might look like. And in general, the diceware ones do are shorter. Um, but we find the period ones to be a little more accessible or relatable. I'm, I'm personally a big fan of the first one that came up, the reindeer ruling insanity rejoin reality. Um, I, I recognize most of these words compared to things like you know, 52, UW, Hera, um, NCAA did make an appearance here um, for any basketball fans, and Idaho, not Boise though. Um, yeah, so this is just our, um, a visual comparison. So um, we haven't, so we'll, I'll talk a little bit about what's coming in the future in a bit, but we had a chance to get our word list into a study done at the University of Bonn. Um, I don't think it's been published yet, it should be out pretty soon. Um, so it's um, uh, a researcher called uh, Sergei Deschamps and um, uh, some of his coll colleagues. And they were actually doing a study on public key uh, comparison and recognition. Um, and so they threw our word list in. 
uh, in addition to hexadecimal, base 32, uh, purely numeric, and the PGP word list. So this is a bit, it's, it's not quite what we're doing. I mean, it's, it's a public key um, test, not a, not, a, not a memorization test uh, for, for passphrases, but it's still fairly interesting because what we saw from that study is that um, it was the fastest verification method among the, the ones that they tried. It was second best in terms of error detection. So the best in terms of error detection was uh, generated sentence-like structures. Um, the second best, it was also the second best in avoiding false positives. Uh, interestingly, the best in avoiding false positive was numeric. And uh, users definitely preferred it over non-language options. So that's a, actually a pretty good mix, um, given that it performed second to different things in different categories. So of course, that's not the same as, as seeing how memorizable it is. But hopefully, that's coming up. Um, but, but still, this, it was pretty, a pretty cool opportunity to get our, to get our, our work into some, some academic papers. And we are looking forward to doing more of that. So from what we have right now, we do know that there are some pain points. And so there are, there are some things that we want to take a closer look at. And we'd love to talk to, uh, to participants about. Um, so one of the things that, that we will ask ourselves is, you know, do subtitles from Friends and Grey's Anatomy belong in you know, various other dictionaries? Um, we do definitely counterbalance because we check uh, the, the, the words gener the, generated by the subtitles against the dictionary in the language that we're, that we're using. Um, but there's still, you can really see the influence of like British colonization and American culture. Um, yes? Being Norwegian, I can tell you right now that the phrase, how you doing, is something that anyone in Norway who has seen friends, they are using that phrase. And if you did it in Norwegian, nobody would have uh, any clue what you're talking about at all. <laughs> Good to know. Example. So, so yeah, so, so there's some tricky things there, uh, though. Like, you know, like, so, so something might be more recognizable in one language and not translate very well. Um, so, so there's some trickiness around there. Um, we, we do see that a lot of names, even English names, end up in the corpuses of every single language. Um, and that, that, that's, you know, that's a, a bit of a question mark for us. So for example, we ask ourselves if we should strip those names out. Um, and should we strip proper nouns? Uh, because they're not a good point of reference for, for a lot of people. But then on the, on the other hand, um, I think this is a particularly cool passphrase, Elizabeth crowned in human glamour typhoon. And sometimes if you have a name in there, that's actually, I feel like that might have some points for memorability, um, especially if you know someone by that name. Um, and I mean, some of this might be nitpicking, but we're trying to make something that, that makes people have a, a very fluid and pleasant experience. And so little cultural things are important to take into consideration. I guess? Um, some names will, um, sorry. Um, I didn't mean for it to take so long. Some names <laughs> will translate differently. For example, yeah. pairs would be in English per se. Yeah. It, it's, it's pronounced differently, and it means something different. My name also. Um, so. Um, yeah. I don't know how you factor that in. Yeah, totally. That's it's it's super tricky. That and it, actually, um, subtitles are interesting for that because subtitles aren't isn't the same corpus depending on the language. Like the media we showed is all Anglo media, but when you look at the subtitles.org, you'll see tons of material from like local news or documentaries or material that may have never been in English Lots either. Of anime. So so you, it actually will frequently um, represent the local culture. You'll see more of the local city names of the names of people in that uh, language or place that can have its own problems like you know when you get to the point of comparing like Brazilian Portuguese versus uh, Portuguese Portuguese but um, you know things we pain, like like we said pain points still. So. So other stuff that we haven't quite dealt with is uh, words that are hard to spell. Occasionally, we manually see something that's like, oh my god, this, is a, this might be a common word, but people spell it wrong all the time. Like, how many people spell definitely wrong? Lots of people spell definitely wrong. So it's the kind of thing that, that, you, that we might want to like just remove that word, because we know sort of anecdotally that it's a, a tricky word to spell. Um, the other thing is words with short edit distances, uh, homophones. Um, that's something that we don't have a systematic way of dealing with, particularly not across languages. Um, and um, we do, so we're, we're a pretty multilingual team. Uh, we're based out of Montreal, and so everything is in, always in English and French. And um, my native language is Spanish, and we've got some Russian speakers on the team, and a Turkish speaker, and we've, we've, got, we've got a bit of a range, but still, we're branching out a lot into languages where we don't have someone who can, who can, obvious, who can notice the obvious flags. 
Um, and one of the flags that we do have so far is actually grammar, which is, and, and there's some stuff that in English isn't as obvious, but once you get into most other languages, um, things like this where you might have, um, so in the first Spanish example, uh, there's a, a noun that is masculine and plural followed by an adjective that is feminine and singular. So that actually causes a lot of cognitive dissonance. And I mean, we don't have any study to base this on, but we've, it's, it's fairly jarring to see. And probably that affects uh, at least the user experience, if not the memorizability, because you would probably tend to make them agree when you're typing it out. Um, so that's, uh, and the same thing happens uh, in French. That's an example where the, the adjective is um, feminine and singular. And, um, and the, uh, the noun after it is plural. So that's something that we might want to look at, you know, like just taking roots of, of words and, um, and making them agree. Um, and then that actually can also help uh, a lot in terms of edit distance. So if anyone here speaks French, um, French has this thing where there's a lot of forms that are spelled differently, but they're pronounced the same. And even native speakers actually confuse them a ton. So if we could actually just unify that and make sure that we're only using one form of a verb that sounds, in a, partic sounds a particular way, um, that would probably go a long way to uh, fixing people messing that up. Um, so, so yeah, so, and then when we look at grammar, I mean, each language has the particular things that we could probably do, and it's a gigantic rabbit hole to go down. Um, so, but that's, that's something that we're super interested in, so if there are any linguists in the room, we'd, uh, we'd absolutely love to talk to you. Um, so, um, yeah, there's some other cool stuff. It's recent. So, so this actually came out like, uh, a moment of panic when, like, two weeks before we were supposed to give this talk, jo uh, Jovino released a new Diceware word list that uh, is phenomenal. We're really interested in playing around with this soon. But um, basically, they removed a lot of the weird words from Diceware. They did something similar. They sourced familiar words through Ghent University's Center for Reading Research, removed difficult to spell words and homophones, removed vulgar and offensive words, uh, and even did, I think this is fantastic, it identified uh, the concreteness of words. And what they mean by that uh, is, for example, you know, picture a screwdriver. You know, it's not hard. You, you see the handle, little metal bit, the maybe star shape or whatever. Now, now picture love. It's a lot easier in the XKCD style to picture concrete objects. If you were told to sit down, here's five words that you can picture. Now try to picture them like that comic with a little horse and a battery and a staple all together. Um, it's a lot easier than trying to picture what love looks like. So they, um, Bono actually made three lists. One is um, the initial dice wear length. Uh, one is a reduced one that only requires four dice instead to hopefully speed up the process of creation and includes uh, the most common words. And then another one that's actually designed uh, to be tuned to autocorrect and autocomplete, which could be pretty fantastic on mobile in the sense that you would only need to ever type three characters to get your word automatically filled in each time. So for like a visual comparison, you know, we, we put them up to see how uh, these uh, our word lists and the short and long ones might compare. Um, one thing to note on the short one is that if autocomplete and autocorrect turned out to work well, people weren't overtyping every time when they were trying to enter the words. That it would only actually be three characters per word. Um, on the other be, hand, I feel like password fields don't usually allow autocomplete, so that's a kind of another set of challenges. There's definitely some implementation challenges yeah. for autocorrect and autocomplete here. Um, the other thing, which made rounds in like popular you know, tech blogs and things like that for a bit was research on passphrase poems. And someone, uh, this was, I, oh my god, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this name, Gaz, Vinijad, and Knight, in their essay, How to Memorize a Random 60-Bit String, tried comparing sentence formulations, the XKCD method, and then poems, because they were like, you know, the ancient Greeks are able to like memorize a thousand page epic poem. Maybe we could do this to memorize a few passwords. And what they found was uh, impressive. So these were the recall rates for their different, their different methods and the user preference. And the po poetry method like vastly outperformed the two sentence methods and even the XKCD method. And importantly, like, people really liked the poetry method uh, versus the XKCD one. Users, you know, again, when we set minimum standards, you'll notice that users actually preferred the ones that they got wrong. Um, so it's one of those things where maybe the user doesn't always know best. Yeah, it's probably one of those things where they insert the correct grammatical forms rather than the uh, incorrect ones. There's two questions maybe over there first. Persistence and recalls, are those in like thousands or people? No, this is people. This is a pretty small, like hands-on. This is like a... Very, 
They're a, yeah. It's a, it's a small study for sure. I think they were measuring frustration, but I don't remember exactly. I'd be interested to know what, what control was used for that, just to make sure that it wasn't based off of the user assumption that they were looking for a secure password as opposed to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's my view, you know, question said, yeah. So, yeah, no, but we, we can also give you that, stu that study if you want to see it. I'm sure we have it. Oh, actually, it's around. also cited at the it's bottom. It's cited, yeah. Um, so, some of the future work that we have uh, in, our, in our development pipeline is some little things that we can tweak in terms of the user interface and user experience in general. Um, so we want to kind of provide some sort of incentive uh, for, for people to do spaced repetition. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if anyone has used Authy. Authy prompts you um, to, to enter your passphrase every once in a while to make sure you didn't forget it. Um, but that's honestly a little bit infuriating. So we figure we can maybe add some spice to it by, at minimum, showing like a cute animation when you do it, and maybe offering some rewards, uh, like more storage space on our, on our platform. Um, we can also do some stuff around trimming, ignoring, and inserting white space, for example, so that if you get if you get the spaces wrong, uh, we correct for that. Um, then looking at the autocorrect and autocomplete stuff that uh, Joseph Bonneau has been doing, that, that could be really interesting. So we, we might, we might dip, dip our, our toes into that. Um, and then another question that we just mostly are confused by is, is how to deal with special characters. Um, because, you know, you can, uh, you, you know, we have a German um, uh, dictionary, but if a German speaker has a German passphrase that has a bunch of umlauts and maybe an S set in it, then like if they travel and they're accessing uh, their, their account from someone else's computer that doesn't have these characters, then they might be a bit screwed. So there, there's a couple of different ways that we could deal with that that we should, um, that we should take a look at. Um, but that's, that's definitely something that's, that's in our future. The other thing is whether it makes sense to let users choose some things. So that can be like usually we have just a button that says regenerate passphrase, regenerate passphrase, and it just cycles through a bunch of options. But we could allow people to just regenerate individual words instead of the whole thing at once. Uh, so if you know if you got something that you like, but the last word is something that you think you can't spell, then you can just re-roll that one. Um, or the other thing is allowing uh, insertion of additional words in between the ones that were randomly generated. Um, so for example, like an article or a preposition um, to make the sentence a bit more sensical to you, that could be a thing that could work. Um, and also just you know al allowing insertion or edits to make something plural, to add a suffix, whatever. Um, that's, uh, that could be interesting as well. Um, and, and we would still have the sort of guaranteed minimum amount of entropy from the, the five or more words that are generated by the system. So, so that could be cool. Um, the, the next thing that, that's coming up as well is we're currently designing a, a field study with uh, the folks at the, Univers the University of Bonn. Um, and so what they have, they have a bunch of different ways of generating uh, passphrases and some control uh, encoding and, and whatnot. And so what we're going to do is we're working on a research edition of Perio where users will be able to use their regular account, but they will kind of go through a wizard that tells them, okay, you are participating in a study. Um, we're going to measure the following things, um, and you will, you know, you will have your, you will be using your passphrase encoded in a different way using a different generator. Um, so, so that's we're going to test for for memorability, um, for speed of entry, for accuracy, and for user preference. Um, so right now what we're getting going through is just kind of designing that study because it's fairly tricky to, to, to figure out how to control for certain things. Um, and, and then the, and in general, you know, we're very interested in doing field studies and working with academic institutions, but... I didn't want to interrupt. I was going to wait until you were ready to switch slides. All right. I, 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 have, I have switched slides. Oh, okay. You said slides. You, you were continuing your thoughts. Skyler, sure. did you make an outrageous speaker request? <laughs> did I? Yeah. To ask for cats. To ask for kittens. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's amazing. Sweet. Nope, that is so going on Twitter. That is that is like the it's, best thing that has ever happened to me. And it what, wasn't even me. It was you. <laughs> <laughs> this is why it never hurts to ask. All right. I, I have learned another thing today. Not just what an epicycloid is. Um, so as I was saying, in terms of designing. Um, 
in designing studies, I mean, we are a security, a secure communications tool, so it's very tricky, and we don't want to turn this into this kind of like horrible thing that people don't read, where you're like clicking through a bunch of like text. So there's a lot of a lot to be done in terms of designing transparent studies and, and having people actually understand what it is that they might be able to opt into. So that's a that's a really tricky question, and it's one that we'd also love to talk to folks about. Um, and on that note, um, there's a lot of ways that we would love uh, for you guys to help out. Um, so we would love to have native speakers review our dictionaries. So I had a, a it's, it, it really helps. Uh, for example, I happened to luckily speak German, but I hadn't caught this until we were preparing for this talk, that actually when we were generating our, our German list, we left out nouns entirely <laughs> because, <laughs> because they're capitalized. Yeah, and, and, we, and our script just didn't account for that. And um, yeah, and luckily I was, like, I was like regenerating in German and was like, there are no nouns. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> and then it occurred to me why, and so I need to go regenerate that. Um, so the other thing is like use, use our dictionaries, they're freely available, um, and just use our passphrases if you want. We have a standalone passphrase generator, uh, passphrases.period.com, where you can just roll in any of the languages. Um, you can also come to us with any research that we've missed or any research that you want to do. Um, and we're also, we would love to collaborate with more folks from, uh, from the research community. Um, and uh, yeah, and we'd love to work on field tests specifically um, if folks are, are interested in that. So you can contact us through Twitter uh, and you can check out our, um, the uh, Passphrases site and you can check out the app as well. Uh, and you can check out our code on GitHub. The app is itself open source. So uh, yeah, that's, I think that's all we have for you. When we say research, I really want to stress that we don't just mean security researchers. If you're into like UX, usability, design, like we, we feel like this is a really crucial and often um, uh, underappreciated and underutilized skill set within the security community. So if, even if it's like what colors you think the passphrases should be when they're presented to users to help mem memorability, like we want to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you. Yeah. They come out. They come out. So uh, before I open for questions, I'm just going to say that Skylar, you told me and you re re revealed it yourself, you didn't know what passphrases was like one and a half years ago. That's true. And Flo, you say you're not an information security researcher. You consider yourself to be just a developer. I'm a developer for sure. Yeah. I am absolutely amazed about this talk. So I, I, I will actually, you know, one more round of applause first. This is really good. And now for, now for questions. Raise your hands. Oh, Jeff wants to ask a question. Well, I'm actually going to bypass Jeff first. <laughs> Too much enthusiasm. There you go. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, maybe obvious uh, question. Um, have you considered, and since you even named them sentences, have you considered making the phrases that are longer than a couple of words, maybe more syntactically um, arranged uh, to improve uh, memorability? So that was actually one of our first thoughts. In that last study we uh, you know, briefly went over, the poetry one, mm -hmm. actually found that they tended to not work. Um, and the problem with it was that um, on one side they got longer. When you st to get randomly generated sentences it, that also aren't you know, easy to look up in a dictionary type attack or butt of quotes, um, yeah, you end up with fairly long sentences. And users were really good at remembering like the semantic meaning of the sentence, but they weren't, uh, in fact, we might actually still have it open, but they weren't very good at remembering the specifics. It would be like, they, uh, where is, this is reversed. Um, yeah, so we do have it here. So they would remember things like, those are some more examples of poems, um, but these are sentences, right? So it would be like, they'd be assigned no dressing allowed under canon law in the youth group, but the person would remember no dresses allowed. And that this is actually what result was the biggest failure for the recall rate for these types of sentences, which is why we were a little more interested in the user introducing their, um, you know, constructing their sentences, because then it actually arguably would add more entropy, right? Because then you can't just do a dictionary attack of like, well, we generated all these words, but did the user add an article to it? Did they change, you know? A suffix. Yeah. Uh, I meant a little bit of a less drastic uh, sentence construction, but I can talk to you later uh, about this. No, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the, the problem is, is so with our, st our standard was 67.5 bits, these are only 60 bits. 
I'm, I'm mm -hmm. going to make sure that they will be at the party tonight so we can discuss. <laughs> Everybody gets to be discussed with them. All right. So, yep. <laughs> um, so uh, this is fantastic. You've been struggling and working out with the same problems that we've been thinking about with one password and trying to, and, and master passwords. And by the way, I'm a PhD dropout in linguistics. Um, so. I, I actually have a bachelor's degree in linguistics, but I don't yes. talk about that. <laughs> hey, okay. Um, so, you, you, you know, so you had us about linguistics. Um, anyway, uh, I'll talk to you about what we've done about Unicode. Um, and I had a whole bunch of different questions and points which have all gone out my head. So I'll just mention one. In the word list that I helped construct, uh, uh, we deliberately chose to avoid derivational and inflectional morphology yeah. um, so that we didn't have a dresses dressing problem with yeah. memorability. Um, oh, right. And the one other question is, where did you get your taboo words for non-English when you, when you were excluding offensive words? Uh Mostly from actual people. <laughs> no, no, there's, there's a, there are some existing word lists. It was, this was like one of my more fun weeks at work where I was uh, <laughs> like, my job is to find all the offensive words in all the languages possible and put them all in one giant nasty list of like 8,000 lines long. And you, you, <laughs> you should come to Norway because the higher, the higher up north in Norway you go, the more common it is to actually use really seriously strong bad language as part of your everyday talking to anyone. To the extent we, that you can't talk without it. And yeah, yeah, pretty we, much, you know, like if you come up there like from, from Oslo as an example, and you go far up north of Norway, they, you know, they will, they will just look at you and feel sorry for you because you're not, uh, you know, you're not capable of saying fuck like every second sentence as an example. We did, so. um, one note, we did have something interesting when trying to source this list. Um, so I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Violet Blue. Um, all right, so her name shows up on a lot of offensive band word lists. <laughs> and, we, and, we, and someone who was trying to you know, go through our list to evaluate it like, got really angry at us. They're like, what's so offensive about Violet Blue? And we're like, oh, we, like, we, we'll take that off. There's, there's nothing offensive to us. But yeah, there are... Um, oh yeah, she saw on Twitter. This, there, this was very public. <laughs> Um, one, one other thing we did for the offensive master list is we actually took out words like nationalities or religions because that could, that's better than taking out negative adjectives and we ended up with a lot of awkward passphrases with constructions like disgusting name yeah, of yeah. country and it's like, okay, well this isn't very nice. Yeah, we've been doing the same. Yeah. I don't ask very many questions but because I'm a spelling dropout, yeah. you mentioned difficulties. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with leaving spelling difficulties in there if you really can spell them, it pertains to you, versus forcing me to spell something like somebody else spells it? Uh, I don't know if I've described that correctly. You mentioned, you used the word difficulties. Does it make, somebody can't spell it? Well, possibly Definitely. I can't spell it, but I probably can. But anyway, why can't you use your own spelling difficulties? I mean, why are you restricted to to what you say you must use. Why couldn't a person actually use their own individual spelling difficulties even in relation to the words? Uh, so, I, have I made myself? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if, if you can misspell the thing correctly, why would you force me to have to remember something that I right. can't spell right anyway? So, so this is where, um, That's a good point. To, towards the end where we were saying it's, it could be interesting to allow users to have some control, so if the user is able to write their whole passphrase, everything we said in the beginning, it will probably apply because people are bad at making their passwords. But if we say, here's some random content and you can play around with it a bit, like, oh, you know what, I know I always spell definitely with this I instead or something like that, then it could be possible that we could say, well, you're allowed to change two or three characters in any word, which if anything would... Uh, because it's, at that point you can just replace all the words with password. Yeah. 
It's, but the, it's, the, 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 we're trying to, we are deliberately trying to set a fairly low bar. And, and I don't think that any of the words would. Um, but yeah, but, but I, I see your point, though, in terms of spelling, like especially if you consider British versus American spelling, we don't want to force one spelling or another. But you are. Um, but we, no, I mean, we are right now. Yes, we are, definitely. But we, that's the kind of thing that we should consider allowing the user to modify that. Yeah. Uh, All right. Uh, Fair enough. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So related to the earlier point uh, about Norway, um, have you considered the option of letting people choose to include vulgar words? Because yes, maybe we have. that's more rememberable for them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. We, we've done that. We've also, like, uh, on the side for fun, I have a Simpsons dictionary. I have a Klingon dictionary. Um, the Klingon one's tough because apparently there's a lot of internal disagreements about how things are spelled and like formatted. <laughs> but like, I was I was not ready for that. Th that's um, another case where people should be able to pick their spelling. There, the, yeah, um, there's been requests for Elvish dictionaries. There's like, um, <laughs> yeah, no, there's there's a lot on the table for that. I'm going to leave it to to Arnold Reynold to ask you the final question. Uh, for, first of all, let me just reiterate that this is a really nice piece of work and. Um, I'm very impressed, and if you guys generate a, a 776 word list, I'd be happy to link it from the Diceware page if you like that. Awesome. Yeah, um, great. Um, and not to be defensive, one little quibble is when you're comparing, I mean, a five-word Diceware uh, passphrase has 65, uh, 64.5 bits of entropy. So, yeah, it's a little less than your target, but comparing it to six is a little bit, mm, Pushing it. Yeah, that's definitely true. I think that was that was a mistake on ours because we were supposed to be comparing it with the 1296 dictionaries that just came out, which would be um, six, sure. a six word to five word. Anyway, yeah, that uh, was. Uh, you know, I, I I want you to know that I spent hours working on this, but not weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so so and 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 one of the challenge and, and I want to just be aware that you're going to have to redo this regularly because the culture changes. I oh, mean, yeah. I, of one of my dice words is A&P, and I don't know how many people in this room I, you know I actually looked that, that up is. like two weeks ago because I was <laughs> like, I was like, I have Yeah, I, I'm sure you do. <laughs> you know, but, but you know, that, they, they've been out of business, and I have some years that would be very familiar in the 1990s that are, you know, like, would drop off the top of your tongue, and so, they're like, why, are you t why do you have 1987 in there, right? I mean, so, so there, there is a... There is a upgrade process involved here. And the final thing I was going to suggest is one of the things, because one of the things I've been on my little to-do list that I may never get to is you really don't want to generate actual sentences because they can be weak passwords because they may actually turn up in a, a search list mm -hmm. for, for, that were generated from songs or whatever. And there, at least in English, there's like a handful of words like the, the forms of the verb to be and a, a few pronouns that basically, if, and, and, and articles, that if you remove them from your list, you eliminate like 75% of possible sentences. So that's something you might also want to think about. Um, so two things. One, one I should say, uh, yeah, we were actually worried. We were like, we were like uh, crap, are we, like, are we being too critical of Diceware? <laughs> um, because, we, uh, you know, again, I started with this like a year and a half ago, and I basically read everything on the Diceware website um, to, get, to get to here. Um, as far as content, one of the fun things about subtitles is that they actually get updated every year. Um, you know, new seasons of TV shows come out, and new, sh new shows come out entirely. Um, so it, it does actually help, uh, as far as a source of language, to stay somewhat relevant. In fact, I think you're even, um, you, c you could if you wanted, went through the effort, actually narrow it down. I only want to take subtitles from shows that have been released from between these years. Um, so there's some fun things you can play around with subtitles as a as a source. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So again, applause for Guru.